Uh, there we go. Right. So just a little bit about me. Um, I'm just a boring Java dev. I do, I'm a software engineer at Open Market. This is a company which is a, a messaging solutions provider. I don't do machine learning at work. It's something that I've learned with DeepRacer. Uh, I'm a member of the DeepRacer community that we founded this year after the London summit. But also, I, I'm a hobbyist baker. I like blogging about things. So yeah, I'm pretty much writing about DeepRacer, about bread, and this and that. So like, just to get some understanding, uh, would you raise your hand if you've already trained at least one model? OK, a few. More than one? Brilliant. So did you ever get stuck in your training? Like, um, I did. So uh, did you ever think, like, OK, I just need to do more training, and then it will just solve it. By it, it, it will solve itself, right? I did this. I had a problem with that in uh, one of the first tra trainings. I didn't know what it was. Like, I didn't understand much about how training is going. So I thought, like, OK. It's not improving. I think I'm just going to add some more hours. It will just work. And, and it didn't. Uh, so pretty much what I was missing over there, I, I didn't ask the right question, which is how good my training is. And this is something that we actually get in community quite a lot. Someone who just has joined, they do the screenshot of this slide, this is, uh, of this big, uh, graph. This is something that you've got in the console. It shows you the average progress and average reward. And the dots are pretty much like per episode, what's happening over there. And people say, like, OK, here's what I've got. What do I do to improve? And this is kind of this is a good thing to ask. And uh, it might give you some information in this graph. But yeah, it will not say why your car is unstable or why you're just kidding getting out of, outside of the track on this particular turn. Uh, it will not tell you whether you should change something or just start over or just do more training because you just need to do more of it and it will be just fine. It all just boils down really to same thing that everyone is struggling with, which is like how to improve my model. Uh, and it's not an easy question. One thing, well, the thing I thought was like, I just need to do more training, but uh, when I was doing this, I was missing a lot of experience. At some point, I just understood that in reality, your model is only as good as you can prove it. This is the moment when I actually started looking for facts around the training. Um, last year, in, in 2018, when Depressor was announced, there were workshops. With workshops came the source code for them uh, in the repository that uh, AWS have shared. There's one folder called Log Analysis. In it, there is a Jupyter Notebook. Have you actually used Jupyter Notebook before? So if you haven't, uh, Jupyter Notebook is what I call like um, word processor on steroids. You've got formatted text. You've got some code blocks that you can execute. And it kind of it prints out pretty graphs and tables and things that are really easy to read. Um, we as a community have taken it on and started adding things to it, like the graphs that uh, Kira was showing before. These things usually people from community just give us uh, to just merge into the repository to have it in the document. This QR code will send you to the repository. I'll be showing it later on as well. So what's up with the logs? So, um, when you spin up problem, uh, when you spin up the Pracer training in the console, what's happening is a SageMaker starts uh, training for you, and RoboMaker starts a simulation in which your car is going around the track and gathering experiences. The car makes a step and decides on what the next step should be or what the next behavior should be. It does it like 15 times a second, and each time it prints out a line like this. Each of them pretty much tells you like um, what iteration it is, what episode it is, where the car is located, where it's heading, what the decision on the action was, and uh, well, more details. It's like just a couple of values over there. Um, one of the things that uh, you can do as well is print out some extra information from your reward function, because reward function is actually just a Python function. If you do just print in it, 
it will also land in CloudWatch in form like this in between those lines. It, you just, if you do it too complex, you might risk performance degradation, which might affect your training. So be careful what you're doing over there. But in general, you can do this. But these, for me, were pretty enough. Um, there is an awesome tool that Python, well, that's written in Python called Pandas. So what Pandas does, it provides you with a way to read logs like that or read large series of data and feed them into a data structure in which you can filter, you can um, calculate new values and look for some patterns. When you read those uh, log lines, you will come up with something like this. These are just those steps described in a more readable format. But what you can also do is aggregate them. So what I've done is uh, I've aggregated them based on the episode number and then you come up with this thing. Over there, you don't uh, get the X and Ys and like your stereo things like that. Instead, you get where you started, what the progress was, what the time was for a given episode, what, the re what reward it was uh, given. Uh, so you get totally new value information, uh, level of information. But then, okay, you, you've got more data and you've got a tool that might answer your questions, but you, you pretty much just need to work out what questions you need to ask. So I would like to share with you what I normally look at. Uh, the Jupyter notebook has grown quite a bit, so it might be um, deterring at first sight. It's quite difficult to find yourself around it. But I've realized that I'm kind of looking at a couple, slide, uh, a couple of graphs of it and in it, and this is pretty much what I want to talk about. So the first group of information that I'm looking for is understanding how the training is progressing. The graph that you've seen initially, the one from the console, is actually doing this, how your, graph, uh, how your training is progressing, but I'm looking for a bit of different information about this. Um, we've got a couple of graphs like that in the notebook. Uh, I normally start by looking at the average progress per iteration. This one normally just shows that each dot says that in a given iteration, and iteration is by default 20 episodes, so 20 times when the car tries to get on a truck. It assembles the how far it managed to go in all episodes and puts it, we get a dot over here. Normally at the beginning you can see that uh, the car is progressing quite quickly, and then it gets a little bit wobbly. So what I've noticed is uh, the zigzags that are happening over there are something that I've, one of the first things I've learned about hyperparameters in, uh, in the training of DeepRacer. One of them is learning rate, which I understand uh, the algorithm tries to work out in which direction to adjust the neural network to get the best results. And the learning rate pretty much determines how big the step should be. If you do it too small, then it will take forever to actually find optimal value. If you do it too big, it will just jumping from here to there uh, in like the weights values, and you might not be able to find uh, any place where you could converge. Uh, so when I see those zigzags, that's pretty much the jumping and jumping thing that I've noticed. When I, I usually then just stop training, lower the learning rate, and just move on to new training session and then it kind of smooths out. It goes slower, but yeah. Uh, today at uh, 3.30, Guy and Alex will have two sessions about how to uh, optimize the hyperparameters. So I, I recommend you to go and see them. But yeah, th this thing gives me some information, but then I could have like 90% over here and no completed laps. So one thing that I do to complement this is looking at the completion rate. So pretty much the, this, the only value it has is, uh, or the only information it has is, if I have, let's say, 20 uh, episodes in an iteration, the 0 0.1 means that I completed two laps. Normally you start with just flat zero over there and then it just goes up at some point, sometimes steeper, sometimes not. Uh, but then at least I want to see some laps completed over there. Sometimes it's beneficial to have many, but not too many as well, because if you've got too many, it might mean that uh, you're slightly beginning to overfit your model, which might mean that instead of learning to generalize, you will train the car to pretty much just work using its memory. It will detect certain features and work on that. If you move it to a different track, it will fail to, do, to pretty much complete. 
And then once I've got enough complete laps, what I look at is the mean completion times. When we're, when we're racing in time trials, it's all about the fastest lap. So what I'm doing is I'm just looking. If it's getting lower, I've got chances to do well either on the track or in the evaluation in the virtual league. Right, so then I kind of ignore the progress part of it. I took, take all the episodes, throw them into a single bag, and then try to find different dependencies in the values. Uh, one of them that I look at is the relation of reward time, um, which is kind of obvious. You always want to make sure that you are rewarding the right things when you're training your car. So this graph actually is showing something that's pretty worrying. Those are only complete laps. And uh, what you can see is the slower the lap is, the higher the reward. Depending on another hyperparameter called the discount factor, which I understand as how much ahead you're trying to look to predict, like uh, optimize your behavior, uh, it might be a problem or not. If, it's, if your discount rate is reasonably low, then you're not, sure, not looking too much ahead, and then it might ignore the fact that the aggregated value is high. But if you're looking quite long ahead, or quite far ahead, then this might actually tell your car, go slower, you'll get higher reward. Normally what you get, uh, you get this because I told you about those steps. Let's say that the reward function that you can, do, you can use to complete a lap you can just do return one and it will work. Your car will actually learn to complete a lap. But then it will learn that if it's instead of going reasonably quickly, it just slaloms from side to side, it will have more steps. More steps will mean more ones. Reward will go up. I should go like slow. I should just slalom, do it as much as possible to just get as many steps in there as, as I can. So what I normally would like this graph to look like would be just go from the top over here and then down over there. And yeah, that's, that's kind of kind, quite promising for me. That's what I'm looking for in here. The second uh, data uh, dependency that I see over here, the pattern, is the progress histogram. I want to see reasonably many completed laps, but not too many at the same time again. So. This one is probably quite early into the training. You can see that most of the episodes just end at 10%, something like that. I want the last bar over there to be really high. This means that I'm actually completing laps, but then also not too high. One thing that you might actually get into is uh, your car will learn to complete laps reliably, but also its behavior will be closer to the average behavior. And this is a good thing to an extent, it's a good thing if you actually want to have a very stable model. But at the same time, let's say that there's just an average performance that it gets like more like it. When you start learning, the, uh, the, you will have kind of a big spectrum of behaviors. Some of them will be better, some of them will be worse, most of them will be somewhere in the middle. The more you train, all of them will be like the middle one. But then what it means is that you will lose the bad ones, but you will also lose the good ones. You need to find something in the middle, to make either to make sure that your mean performance just moves into the optimal behavior, optimal state, or, or you just mean to make sure that your, your, um, your model is random enough or unstable enough to give both good and bad ones. In virtual league, you're all about the fast, one fastest lap. So, if you get one fast lap, you'll do better than someone that has decent 100 <laughs> average laps. Which, yeah, this is what it does, so you need to look at it. And then when I, when I finish looking at this thing, I move over to a different set of dependencies. There's a set of graphs that look at how your car is doing depending on where it starts in track. So in this uh, graph, the x-axis is just... Uh, when you train, you've got a set of waypoints around the track. They, they define the center line. And depending on where you start over there, your car might just behave differently. <coughs> this graph shows the progress depending on where you start. The thing that I, uh, I normally look out for is, if I'm looking for stability, I want to have a lot of 100 dots over there. 
If it's a virtual league, then I'm more about starting at zero point because the race normally starts at zero point zero to have a, hundreds over, a, hundred, a lot of hundreds over there. If it's a physical race, I want hundreds all across the line over there because sometimes you just get off track and you need to start at that point. If you're not prepared to do this, you'll just lose it. One thing that I've noticed in this graph, you can see the slope over here, the white, white stripe over here. So what's happening is, depending on when your car starts, it probably speeds up and then fails miserably around waypoint 150. Is it a good thing or a bad thing? I'm not sure, to be honest. One thing I've noticed, however, is between 100 and 150, we've got some progress. So you don't get many over here, but here you've got those that actually get past it. So what I'm guessing this one was is, uh, at 150, there's probably a sharp turn. And then either I was going too fast, or my action space was not optimized to just go past this turn. I suspect it was too fast because here, these ones, they didn't have time to speed up. So going slower, they just went past the turn and succeeded. Now, should I update my action space because of that? Well, maybe yes, maybe not. But then, if it's a virtual league, and I think it was virtual league, I've got a lot of completions over here around waypoint zero. So I might just not bother about those because this is what I care about. So this is sort of patterns that I'm looking for in the graphs over there. <laughs> then I look at the action breakdown. Actually, uh, Kira showed a couple of graphs that I haven't seen before. He hasn't shared it with the community yet. Probably that's how he made it to the finals. Uh, where you go around the track, your car makes decisions. Again, like 15 steps per second, decision, decision. So each dot over here is uh, related to one of the actions. This one is probably quite wobbly model. You can see that there's a lot of left turns on the straight. And then you've got histograms that show it like as it goes along the track. Looking at that, you can find some actions that are not being used, and you might want to get rid of them. But you can also find some actions that are used very heavily, and you might think, maybe, maybe I want to do something different. If you want to get rid of the action, the good thing about it is the fewer actions you've got, the faster it will take for you to converge with the training. The more you've got, it will be more expressive, but then it will take forever to finish. Right, so I finished looking at the aggregated values and then sometimes I need to find something to go more in depth. Uh, in the graphs, with the, in the uh, scatters that I showed before, quite often you will see just a dot that just sends out some fast lab that had average reward, or maybe some slow lab that had really good reward, or maybe just the perfect one that you want to look at, understand more, and do more like that, and promote it more. Uh, I use this, pretty much these are the ones that I look out for in the scatters, in the graphs. Then I identify which episode it is and I try to plot it. I see what's happening around the track, why I, I, why I did fast, why I went fast. Sometimes I might have some reward that's off. Then looking at step by step, I can detect which step had a reward that it shouldn't receive. But also at the same time, sometimes I want to see the fast one. So, this graph, over, uh, this plot over there, it's from September. This was my, uh, the lab that made me win the virtual league in September. Uh, the time was 8.64. The time is a little bit off at the, uh, on the header. I don't think I could have done faster. But for this one, I actually used the action breakdown that I showed you before. I had problems getting past here. And then I realized that my car, when my car was going like wide, behind from out, out of this turn, it was struggling to get past this chicane. So I altered my action space, making it difficult for it to continue when it goes along this border. And it adjusted. I literally saw it adjust its behavior and started going more to the inside. And it did this in nice smooth turn till here, which was just enough for it to get past this curb over here and then around and, and yeah, that's how it worked for me. But yeah, you might look in depth, you might find things that work, things that didn't work, and you might have an idea on how to improve your reward function. 
So what you normally do is you write your reward function, you load it, you start trading, wait three, eight, ten hours, whatever long it takes, and you might find out, okay, this worked or it didn't work. This is pretty much the question that I asked in the beginning. Like, if you think I'm going to train more and, and then it's going to work, it might not. And there's a risk associated with this. So one thing I've come up with, I'm actually really proud that I managed to come up with this, is you cannot alter the training that already happened. But what you can do, you can take those logs, convert them into input parameters for a reward function, and replay them using new reward function and see if the reward would shape slightly differently. It won't update your existing model, but will give you some insights into whether you can do better or not. So that's pretty much what I'm doing. I'm translating this into the parameters, feeding it into a new reward function, and getting all the graphs that I've seen before to compare against the ones that I already had rewards for. There are some lots of precisions, there are some drawbacks associated with it, so it's not ideal. But Using this, I managed to do as much progress in June within 12 hours that I had a whole month to do within May, and I struggled with it because it turned out that I was just rewarding wrong things. Using that, in, uh, in August, I believe, I actually managed to come up with reward function that gave me the second place in August and place in the finals, and first place in September, and 14th in October where many new people joined. <laughs> so, just a quick recap of what we actually added as a community to the notebook that uh, AWS shared. The AWS notebook has pretty decent things in there which help you get started and make you get curious. When I saw it first, I didn't know how to run Jupyter Notebook, so I had all the learning curve to do. <laughs> all the obstacles that were in my way. When I realized it was like an aha moment, then I actually started updating it straight away. So what we've done is we split it up in a couple notebooks. We're thinking about how to do it more in a simpler way to be more comfortable for new people to use and understand. We did some performance optimization with it. Uh, what I've learned is most of the plotting use normal iterations Pandas has some uh, magic in it, which is very performance. So there are some approaches, some solutions in it that make it work much faster. Some of the graphs, like the reward graph that I've shown you from the September race, with the version from AWS, it would take over one minute to plot it. With the version that we've prepared as a community, within one minute, I'm plotting a whole month of graphs and I'm not losing memory. So this is pretty much the scale of uh, improvement that we've done. But also, one thing that I really need to emphasize is the community. Uh, as I said, I've never done machine learning before I touched Deepracer. I still probably don't know how to do it 100% or at all. But I knew, I've learned how to race and I've learned many things about it already. I'm more about, about community because I like contributing. And this is something that is really incredible in, the, in here. I got so much feedback, I've improved the, the tool that I started working on and we decided to come back to the community with a challenge in October. So we challenged people to come up with improvements and new additions to the notebook. We've had some uh, pretty decent uh, solutions over there like finding the ideal line around the track or having more interactive graphs. Uh, one thing that you struggle with usually is uh, handling all the logs because each training has a, uh, its own log. There's a lot of it. We had people who joined and said like, I don't know how to code. How do I, how can I do this? It's annoying that I cannot ma manage the logs. One guy literally was asking how to load files, how to read them. And he came up with a solution that reads the log, detects what track it was running against, what action space was in there and does like a inventory of all the logs, then you choose one of them and it spits out a new notebook based on the template that you go in and you can work with this log file. So you get uh, one thing that's problematic with Jupyter Notebook is uh, measure requests, pullouts, when you do source control, this is like a JSON that's generated inside. It's nearly impossible to just merge it. So what he thought about is like, I'm going to have this template that people will not be touching and I will just spit, uh, spit out this uh, 
new notebook which you can work with. It will will not be shared, uh, versioned. And yeah, so really incredible additions from people who actually wanted to add something to it in the community and didn't know how to do it in the beginning. Uh, that's something that is really incredible. We will be probably working on how to make it more comfortable for people. But this is not the only way to do it. For instance, I, look, I use CloudWatch Insights. When I'm away from my house, I cannot just spin up Jupyter Notebook and look at the logs. I read through them in Insights and aggregate them to know how my race submissions did, for instance, because I can do it on my mobile phone, it works pretty decently. Uh, one of the community members, Antonio, Antonis, he shared a spreadsheet with, into which he loads the logs and because it's kind of, it resonates with him. But also, one guy, um, Ray Go, he will be talking tomorrow at 1.30, showing his setup, what he's doing. He's more of a bash guy. So he uses Python only to just set up things at the beginning, but then he reads the logs as he does the training and has real life stats updated. He pretty much just spins up the whole console with graphs that just alter as the car is going around the track. It's looking really awesome. He'll, ha he'll have some videos, as I said, tomorrow at 1.30. I really recommend going, uh, coming and listening to him because it's really awesome. So yeah, that's pretty much it. This is the uh, QR code to get into the repository if you want to, because it's kind of long. I do recommend that you join the, the community. But yeah, if you've got any questions, then here's your time now. Yeah. We do have some questions about the session that came over social. Um, just a second. Yo, take this back. Uh, the first question is: um, uh, Should I tweak the hyperparameters or focus on reward functions? Um, hyperparameters are something that will not make a mediocre training excel, but they can ruin a brilliant reward function and action space. So what I think you should look at, you should focus on, is pretty much both of them. Just at first make sure that your reward function and action space have some potential, and then go with the defaults at the beginning. And then as you see that some things are changing their behavior, you can try a different approach. I normally don't update a lot of the hyperparameters. I mainly focus on the learning rate. As I said, Len, I don't see those zigzags over there on this graph and the discount rate, which is how far ahead I'm looking. The rest of them, well, I don't understand many of them too much, so I'm still learning about this. I'm staying with the defaults and they're working pretty decently for me. Okay, very good. Uh, the, the second question is, uh, what is, what is uh, learning rate and entropy, and how does that affect, how does that impact, or what is the effect of that with my model? So the learning rate is, well, I, what I, like I said during the training, is pretty much how big of a step of improvement you make. Because when the maths is happening behind the scenes, that's how, that's how I'm pretty much in, uh, visualizing this. When the maths is done saying like, this is direction to improve your behavior, then pretty much you close your eyes and make a step. <clears throat> if it's too big, you don't know what's ahead. If it's too big, you'll lose the optimal area where you're in, or you might jump into a better one. Sometimes you need that. So it's, it's the risk that you're taking. If you set your reward function to uh, your learning rate too high, you will jump over to the next area and it might help you, it might just ruin your training. If you set it too low, then you'll need a week to converge in the, instead of three hours. But sometimes it also makes sense. I've done quite a lot of training where I was tweaking the action space slightly, but my learning rate, this was giving me only slight adjustments in behavior, but I was already quite close to the optimal behavior. And then just hacking around with the action space made it alter slightly, which worked out pretty well for me. And the second one was high, uh, entropy, right? That's right. Yeah. That's so right. with the entropy, it's more of a how random the action will be. When you do the deep, brain, deep learning, uh, the actions that are being decided upon are 
Initially, they are completely random because it starts with either random weights in the neural network or just flat value. I don't remember which one it is. So at the beginning, it will be completely random. <coughs> but then if you continue your training, at start, the entropy, the higher the entropy is, the more likely you will have you are to have an action that's altered from what your model would normally decide upon. Um, it might be good to have higher entropy if you're still wanting to explore more and look around with place. Uh, with uh, things with the lower entropy you might kind of reinforce your behavior or strengthen it which also you risk overfitting so you need to be careful about that okay great we have one more question uh, is there any way that we uh, don't have to use panda uh, like you showed is there another option that we can uh, we can use yeah so if you go to the community, uh, there's a guy called Antonis. Uh, we're working with him to transfer his um, tools, his solutions based on the spreadsheet into the knowledge base. If you go to the deepracing.io, it's not only a wiki page, it's not only a blog and the Slack channel, it's also a wiki page, which is our knowledge base. We're trying to assemble things because we started it pretty late, but it already has some information in it. We're working to transfer his description on how he does the log analysis using Spreadsheet, which is just a comfortable tool for him to work with. And yeah, so that's one thing. And then if you have like the geeky inner self inside of you and you like terminals, then I do recommend that you visit Ray Go's talk tomorrow at 1.30 because he'll be showing his tools and they are really, really awesome. Uh, yeah, the, uh, the, the, the next part of that was, uh, uh, do you have any experience or would you recommend using uh, CloudWatch Logs Insights for that? So with CloudWatch Logs Insights, what I'm doing is when I don't have access to, uh, to the Jupyter Notebook, which I'm kind of comfortable using, I do aggregate the logs uh, per episode. I especially use it for my sub race submissions where I just don't sit and I don't look at the trading. There is a notebook that you can use for evaluations and for race submissions. It's kind of, it has some things removed that you don't care about over there. But sometimes I'm just not near my computer and I'm just resubmitting, resubmitting. So then I use the insights to look into it. I've only focused on just aggregating the log lines. I know that there are other solutions over there that I would like to approach where I would just um, scoop out certain values from the log lines and uh, graph them. I haven't done this. I want to try it after the reinvent. Okay, thank you so much for that. Thank Do you very much. Any questions at all?